I want to thank our two speakers for joining. We've got Lee Terrell and Paul Whiten, and they're both with Cortico Metrics. And we're going to be talking about reproducible neuroimaging today. And neuroimaging is exciting to me as a data nerd in that it's, there's really a deluge of data that people are dealing with, point number one. It needs to be sifted in very interesting ways. And in this talk, we'll hopefully give you some tools and techniques for sifting through large data sets and, and also reproducing with versioning some of the, the key elements of those pipelines. I do want to run through a quick introduction of our speakers. So Paul has a PhD in computer science from Simon Fraser University. And he worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging at MGH, where he investigated real-time MR imaging applications. Paul's passion is for translational science, and he's currently helping the Cortico Metrics team to design solutions for their technical and regulatory challenges. Lee is a software engineer and data scientist at Cortico, one of Paul's colleagues. And he is, his background is in molecular neuroscience with a BS from Northeastern and a master's in philosophy from the University of Hong Kong. He started in recent years to focus on more computational domains, learning Python and Unix tools through self-study and on the job training, only way to learn at Marinos. Mm -hmm. And professionally, he's interested in reproducible science, data visualization, open source software and translational research. Uh, I wonder if you, would both tell us a little bit about, about Cortico and, and where you fit in this space of neuroimaging. Sure. Um, yeah, so as you mentioned, Cortico Metrics is a neuroimaging focusing com focus company. Um, we spun out of a lab uh, at the Martino Center, um, which is based at Mass General Hospital in Boston. Um, and this lab developed a open source, or still develops an open source uh, neuroimaging analysis software called FreeSurfer. Um, so our goal is basically to take this software and um, basically do the regulatory um, work and uh, to commercialize it and provide um, clinicians and radiologists the quantitative uh, neuroimaging information that they can be used to assess or detect a wide range of neurological disorders um, uh, that uh, they normally treat in the clinic. Um, so our first product uh, was recently cleared by the FDA and we call it THINK. Um, I'll just give a quick overview of what it does. So we take a brain MRI scan um, and create a segmentation which labels all the anatomical structures of the brain um, using the a software tool called FreeSurfer. Um, so this provides uh, a means to quantify the volumes and thicknesses of all the different brain regions, which clinicians can use to uh, detect fine scale changes over time that is useful in tracking these many neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and this uh, gives a quantitative approach to more traditional uh, practices that are used in the clinic, like kind of manually comparing um, images and how they change over time. Okay, got it. And do you want to tell us a little bit about maybe you seem to suggest that in prior epics, there was this uh, maybe a more manual process for reviewing these images. And now you're starting to automate this. So can you talk a little bit about the difference the before and the after in the industry? Yeah, Paul, maybe, Paul, you might want to uh, describe it because you kind of did some scattering and have more hands-on experience. Sure. So, um, yeah, there's, <clears throat> there's, there's a bunch of human intervention with our, with our data curation. And um, we, we curate data sets for, for two purposes. Uh, we create um, data sets with ground truth, which we use to evaluate the performance of our algorithms. And then we also curate data sets um, before they're fed into the input as to a model to make sure the to make sure that our modeling has reasonable data as inputs. Um, both these processes are pretty technically challenging right now, and um, especially the first one where we're we're curating ground truth data sets. Um, the FDA really wants um, 
really credentialed clinical people doing that work and their time is very valuable. So anything that we can do to make that process easier or faster or, or less painful for, for, for the clinicians is, is something we're really, we're really interested in. And, and we're really excited about Quilt's ability to, to kind of step in there uh, with, with that process. Yeah, you brought up something which I think is an industry-wide theme, which is that subject matter experts are very short on time. So of course, there's this whole machine learning initiative to what can we do with supervised machine learning to take very expensive human labels and parlay those into machine labels, I think point number one. But point number two, which you started to get to was these workflows where machines and people need to collaborate and maybe you need to get some labeling or get some input from multiple people are kind of a big data challenge. And it's like, you know, you have these scatter gather patterns where you're sending maybe images out for labeling or feedback, then you have to gather them together, turn them into a, a data set. Uh, I'm wondering if you would talk about that in the context of, of reproducibility and maybe, maybe if we can see kind of the before and after. You, you started to get on the, the interesting parts of, of how you've changed your data infrastructure with Quilt, but it might be, it'd be really interesting, I think, to understand what you did before and, and maybe where you landed today. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, let me kind of skip over uh, to a better slide. Well, I guess I can start with this one. Um, so basically for our, um, I guess, reproducibility pipeline, we use uh, Git for versioning our code and then um, Docker for encapsulating that code and uh, all the computational environment needed to run it. Um, and in our more uh, more recently, we've been trying to incorporate Quilt, but, but previously to track changes in our data, it's more of a like kind of manual process where we take our input, we save it in a specific place, and then keep track of where the output goes and uh, make sure we don't overwrite things or try not to change anything and uh, kind of encapsulate where the data goes within the code. Um, with Quilt, uh, though, we, it's able to more accurately and, I guess, uh, precisely version our data so that if someone accidentally deletes something or moves it, we'd uh, be able to um, make sure we can still point to the exact version we're supposed to, as opposed to whatever happens to be there at the time. Um, and with these uh, three pieces, where each have a, a hash, so, um, we know using that hash, we can get the exact version of the code data and environment we use to create results. Um, and our current infrastructure, um, where we're kind of incorporating Quilt on top of, is in, within AWS. Um, so right now, our, our data is stored in S3 buckets, both the inputs, um, inputs in one place, outputs in another. Uh, and then we run our processing using AWS Batch, um, which kind of allows us to do uh, run all our Docker containers in parallel um, and then uh, save the output um, within S3. So the, the good thing about Quilt is we basically just need to add that on top of our current infrastructure. So it's pretty, pretty minimal changes um, for us to be able to get all the added benefits of um, data versioning and then um, also more interactive visualization and I guess reporting and dashboards that uh, um, are important to us. Because um, uh, when we, we share with these subject matter experts um, to inspect our results or um, want to get some feedback on uh, how our segmentation works, maybe these aren't technical users. So we want to be able to uh, share it in a easy to use way that you don't need to basically know how to use a command line to um, interact with, uh, with our results. And I'll just add before quote, we were using the, the native versioning of Amazon S3, but that is a little cumbersome to use. I, it, I guess it works in theory, but if you're trying to roll back between snapshots of data sets, it's, it's a little cumbersome. Yeah, that's a, a really interesting point. And I think just a, a note for the audience is that the S3 object versioning is kind of at the atom level. In other words, if you have to roll back a whole data set, there's a lot of accounting that you have to do. Like, oh my God, this is 600 objects, 6,000, 6 million object versions. 
And, and then quilt is kind of at the, the molecule level, if you will, you mm -hmm. take a bunch of these versioning atoms and put them together into one monolithic thing. So yeah, that's a lot of what we've done in the open source, I think is encapsulate that accounting. Uh, both of you were starting to talk about something which I see across all of biotech and I'm super interested and passionate in, and it is how do you get developers and non-developers to collaborate in structured ways? And I, I feel like Git answered the developer to developer collaboration part because, hey, we're all writing code. So, so talk to me a little bit and maybe you can even show us a little bit about this interface between where do the non-developers come in? So, so here, I think we have a good view of the developer pipeline and you're emitting things from your batch pipelines into S3. And now how do we now bring a, a non-developing subject matter expert into, into play here? Uh, sure. Um, let me, I guess, go into the next slide. Whoops, um, wrong direction. So I guess the more um, traditional approach, which some technical subject matter experts would be uh, used to, is basically downloading the data and then using desktop-based tools to visualize it, um, which uh, is great, but then the proportion of users who are at that technical level is kind of small. And also then that leads to problems where someone downloads the data, then you say that a month later, they want to look at it again, and it might have changed on, um, yeah. on our, uh, we did some more analysis, and then we actually care about a new version, and they have the old version. Um, so our first pass at uh, uh, getting around this is using Jupyter-based dashboards, um, where we basically took, uh, did our processing, um, got our version uh, that we wanted in Quilt, and then spun up a instance, um, and then used Quilt to pull down that those data sets into a okay. um, specific place, and then roll out a, a, a dashboard using a tool called uh, Voila. And let me see if I can get it going. Uh, do you still see the presentation or do you see a different tab? No, we see your new tab. Okay, cool. Um, so we, uh, uh, after the, the results of our processing, we have different value, uh, volumes for different structures of the brain that uh, different um, clinicians could care about different ones. So we put everything together into this one graph where you can switch through different uh, brain regions and see the values. Um, and this is important for if someone wants to assess uh, finding an outlier subject, like right here, you can go through and see this, uh, this patient information and then um, you can click on it and it would load an interactive visualization where they can go scroll through the brain wow. and see um, how our segmentation looks and then um, look at the different uh, different regions and uh, first assess whether if the reason is an outlier could be a bug in our code or it could just be this patient's uh, structure is either really big or really small and that's uh, clinically in interesting where they might want to do some follow-up um so and now it goes back um yeah so we that's developed this tool uh to kind of quickly go through and look at um different uh subjects and um get a overview of what it looks like yeah, that's really neat. And I guess there's two things here. So what we've always said is that a problem visualized is a problem half solved. And it looks like what you're going here is you're going from a 2D project projection of the data to where people can start to sniff outliers and then they can go into the full volumetric imaging and see, is this truly an outlier or is this a ghost in the machine? So to speak, you mentioned it could be a bug in the software. Would you, I'm curious, I'm sure the audience is wanting to know how you built that visualization. And I think there's a little, some interesting background there, like which toolkits would you use to, to build a visualization like that? Um, so we use, uh, I guess I can go back to the slide because I have the logos for everything here. Um, so for neuroimaging um, specifically, we use a tool, uh, a package called Nylearn, and this provides tools for um, visualization, creating visualizations uh, like screenshots and uh, whatnot for, from neuroimaging results. And that's what we use to create the, um, I guess the, from the 
a specific neuroimaging file format to um, what is loaded as an HTML rendering of, uh, of the brain imaging data. Um, and that's what's shown there. And also we use it to take uh, those, uh, a screenshot of like one slice of the brain, which is shown on the bottom here. Um, to build the graph, we use Altair. Um, so this is based off of uh, Vega and Vega Lite, which is, a, I believe, a JavaScript library. But I'm not a JavaScript coder. I just use Python. And this is a wrapper around all that. So it's, uh, it's newer than the more traditional matplotlib-based um, Python visualization uh, toolkits. But uh, I found it really cool to cool and easy to use to create interactive graphs. So um, that's how it's easy to build this like brush to select um, different, uh, uh, different features of the graph. And then you can hover over things and see, um, uh, see more information directly in the browser. Um, and then and I'll, just, I'll just mention that this is available on our GitHub. Um, so you can check that out. Maybe we can put the link in the description. Yeah, let's let's yeah. definitely do that. Yeah, and actually, I mean, that's a great segue. Do you do you want to talk? A lot of the solutions that you've talked about so far are open source. So uh, Docker has a huge open source component. Quilt has a huge open source component. Ditto for Git. Altair, I believe, is all open source. Vega and Vega yep. Lite are certainly open source. Do you want to talk uh, for a minute about about the role of open source, both in your work, number one, and and maybe in your ability to find these best of breed pieces and assemble them into the solution that you have? Yeah, definitely. So we're basically an open source company. I mean, we have our own proprietary stuff, but our main um, neuroimaging analysis is based off an open source uh, code base. Um, and this is great because uh, we get all the experts contributing their latest, greatest algorithms um, into something that everyone can use. And then we pull that in and kind of do the last step of pa packaging it together and uh, for well, for cl cl clinical applications specifically, there's the added step of regulatory compliance, which is uh, much harder than uh, the scientific approach of sharing um, sharing uh, code is, uh, is used to. Um, but yeah, so we we are able to get these best uh, possible algorithms, and then uh, community feedback on on. Uh, fixing bugs and all that sort of thing, um, and then incorporate it all into uh, something that um, I guess is maybe better than the sum of its parts, and at least has, and also has uh, many more eyes on it. To uh, you know, if someone uh, finds finds a specific use case that they want, it's all shared to um, everyone who uses that package. And yeah, we're all we're all big open source uh, fans and advocates at Corecometrics, but. Uh, it's really the only way for a, a, a lean startup to stay competitive. You know, uh, we just couldn't afford the the equivalent non-open source packages. So Great. it makes a lot of sense for us. <laughs> and and I have a, Lee. I, I've chatted out Rend, and I'm wondering if if you want to if you can pull that up, and and it might be neat for the audience to just see where they can find you on GitHub. Yeah. Um, so. Let me just go to that page. So Cortical Metrics has its own organization where we have some of our uh, um, packages that we release. So Rend is mostly, um, so this talk uh, takes a lot of components from a talk we gave at JupyterCon this past, um, in 2020, last October. Um, so this Rend repo uh, is the repo based off of, um, based for that uh, conference. So we're hoping to, um, right now it's kind of designed specifically for that one use case of creating creating this interactive dashboard uh, specifically to get a demo going. We're hoping to um, kind of incorporate, clean up that and make it a little nicer so someone can more easily take their own data in um, and uh, create their own interactive dashboard um, right. from make, like a command line tool type thing. So, so in this recent exploration, I'd say in the past five minutes, to uh, first of all, I think that that code—it's no secret that code versioning is far ahead of data versioning for the industry, and and I think people are still—I think the industry is still catching on to, hey, why would I need to version my data? 
But both of you, you each mentioned separate and really interesting use cases, which might not be that obvious for data versioning. Uh, the first one I, I wanna pick on is, is one that you, I think Paul mentioned, and it was, you're saying, well, or, or I don't, maybe it was Lee, that there's no way for two people to collaborate. Let's say they download a data set and it drifts away from what they have a month later. And now they're essentially looking at an old version of the world uh, what does that do to collaboration when, when you have different people with different copies of the data set? Slows it down for sure. Um, it's, it, yeah, we, we, we kind of ran into that problem at the early days of Corticometrics, you know, one of us would be working on a data set and the other one would be trying to like run or analyze results from a data set. And then there just have to be a lot of talking back and forth. Oh yeah, I removed that data point for this reason and that sort of stuff. So that's, you know, that whole workflow is what, what one of the re things we'd really like to formalize um, is just streamline all those problems. <laughs> that feels, I think, like like one of the classically hard problems in computer science is we're talking. Are we talking about the same thing? So you know, it, it's a very right, and and oftentimes people are not because data is kind of this floating, flapping pointer in the air, which is like, oh, you know, well, the data, well, which one? You emailed me four times, or we have nine different folders on Box. And, and Lee, I, I'm wondering if you would show in Quilt maybe how the process of pointing somebody to a versioned entity becomes easier so that now you can actually say, point to a thing in the form of a web URL and say, hey, let's all talk about this specific thing, this specific data set. Yeah, so we have, um, so basically with Quilt, you get this nice catalog of your um, data that you, um, I guess, are tracking using Quilt. And you're able to create packages, which are um, the versioned entities of, uh, of the data that you're tracking on S3. Um, so I created a package for um, the, basically the JupyterCon talk um, and the, basically the data that was used to create that initial interactive visualization. And then you're able to uh, uh, basically get a landing page where you can point, uh, point to show a readme and then also a Jupyter notebook potentially if you wanted to that uh, did the analysis. Um, and you also keep track of different versions where right now it's latest, but if you wanted a specific version, you can click on that version um, and then you have the, uh, the data at that point in time when you um, uh, save that version, kind of like a git commit, um, but for your mm -hmm. data set. And if you want it to be really completely accurate with your, um, when you send a link to someone and make sure everyone only looks at that specific version, we can just use, send this really long link with the whole, uh, whole hash instead of just, um, what is it, just the uh, latest version. Um, right. Yeah, that's interesting. And I wonder if you talk about in your work, maybe in the context of the pipeline that you set up a little earlier, what incurs a version? Like when would you create of a data set? When would you push a new version of a data set or even create a new version of a data set? Um, so I guess when, let me go back to this slide. So when we do the processing, we maybe send out uh, hundreds or thousands of jobs using AWS batch. Um, then once, so that whole data set might be a thousand jobs that runs in parallel. And then once all those are completed, either successfully or fail, failed, um, then that's probably when we want to track that version of the output. So it's um, the processing of all the um, data in one data set. And we can, at that point in time, point to um, the uh, results from those thousand files and create a package um, mm -hmm. um, within Quilt. So if I understand correctly, so, so batch is doing its thing. So all the batch threads are racing, they're writing something to S3, but when batch finishes its work, you can then go to, you just snapshot the state of S3 in a Quilt package and that represents a given pipeline map. Yeah, exactly. So we can basically do what we did before of saving to a specific point, a uh, specific folder or uh, object path on S3. And then now we just do that one step of like quilt package uh, that point. And now we get every, every advantage we have with quilt on top of the, the same thing we just did before. Um, 
of running all our data and storing it. We, we write a lot of code, parallel code that we run in Lambda. Actually, we're just starting to play with batch now. And parallel debugging is kind of a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm wondering if, I mean, I think this is another one of the hidden things that I sleep better at night when my pipelines are built from version to components. And I'd wonder if you, if you talk about debugging in this context, like, so, you know, how do you, how do you trace a run back? Uh, let's say you have a bad run. Let's say the run doesn't finish. What, what is that process involved in? And, you know, across Git, Docker and Quilt, how, how do you use versions during that debugging process? Um, so I guess from starting with Git, uh, we use uh, CI, CD um, uh, within our Git repo. So when we push a change to our code, it um, uh, builds uh, our new Docker containers directly there. So our Excellent. code and Docker are pretty tightly, um, our Git and Docker are pretty tightly linked. And then we also, um, to even more tracking of that, we tag our Docker containers with the git commit um, that was used to build them. So we're pretty confident that when that those two won't go out of phase, we kind of stopped do, using the uh, Docker latest um, tag, right, to make sure that we're never uh, so to kind of be more precise with our versioning of Docker and, and Git. Um, and we cache all our own Debian and Python packages. So we can rebuild that container, even if the repositories change in the future. Oh, yeah. tell me about that. So uh, I think you meant that you your Debian and Python packages are more than just in the Docker layers. I think you meant that you you stash them in S3 somewhere. Tell, tell me about that. Yeah, so I mean, we, we you know, we, we have a, a process to build our Docker containers and those usually, you know, will run apt-get or some pip install or something like that. Um, but we what we do is we, we download and archive all those packages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um just you know just so that like five years from now we can go back and we can be confident that we can rebuild that exact container um, i see so, yeah, so it's not that requirements txt doesn't work so much that it might not work in five years <laughs> like like so in other words if it's pinned pinned to some ancient thing you might go to pypi and like oops sorry yeah, and this may be a little bit more for FDA requirements, but just to make us feel safe at night, <laughs> sleep better at night, um, we have the exact uh, files on disk that were used to install those packages. Right. So, um, uh, so then, if, yeah, five, five years from now, we need to completely rebuild the exact uh, Docker container that we, um, we gave to someone to use, then we have all the... Um, uh, nothing needs, it doesn't need to touch the internet to um, uh, get all the build requirements. Yes. Yeah, so our S1, S3 bucket. Right, right. And, and I mean, you you touched on, I can, so we've talked about these unexpected use cases for versioning. Um, one was debugging, another one was collaboration. And I feel like you just brought up the third one. And, and it's a word that you both mentioned. And I think, you know, everybody's blood pressure went up a little bit when you mentioned, but it's compliance. Yeah, and, and uh, I'd love it. Uh, first of all, I'd love to hear about I, that's clearly an integral part. And it felt like that was one of the tensions when you were talking about open source software that like, well, in the open source, you just kind of share everything. But when it comes to either clinical data or compliance. And so I wonder if you, you both would expand a little bit on compliance and versioning and, and what those two things have to do with each other. Sure. Um, so there's, I guess, two you know, big reference documents for anyone working with uh, medical devices, and, and that's uh, ISO 13485 and ISO 62304. Um, one is the standards for how a quality management system uh, needs to be established that the medical device is developed under. So the quality management system just defines a bunch of business processes that need to follow, like, uh, design review and risk management and cybersecurity and, and those sorts of things. And then 62304 is the software development process for medical devices. Um, and, and both of these processes are, are, are just a giant, giant workflow problem, you know, like a bunch of activities have to happen and they like the outputs of some have to feed into the inputs of others and you need to iterate until there's consensus and it's, 
you know, so I spent a lot of time on thinking about how you could orchestrate workflows like that, that have some sort of a lot of human steps in, in the middle. Um, I don't have all the answers just yet, but, but I'll say I'm, I'm thinking a lot about that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one one important thing, how it relates to our, I guess, our uh, software specifically is that we need to be able to trace uh, requirements from basically these uh, requirement documents we write all the way through to um, how we build the software and then um, how we validate the software to make sure we say um, what we say we're doing is actually happening. Um, and yeah, it's a lot easier when we have these uh, specific versions. We we know that our code, the code we're um, validating, is the exact version. Um, we know the exact version using Git and Docker. Then the third point of we know the exact version of the data we're using um, uh, using something like Quilt. It sounded like the magic word there was traceability, and it's you know compliance. <laughs> Paul, if I may crudely summarize what you said is a very cumbersome process of justifying <laughs> everything that you've done, right? And now the question is, how do you justify anything in the most general sense if it isn't traceable? So what, like without immutability, there's traceability doesn't mean anything, but this is the beautiful thing about hashing. If I have a SHA-256, I can basically claim with some great certitude that this is in fact the entity, and if it's digitally signed, this is the entity that I was talking about. So it sounds like, to me, traceability is the technical side of compliance. Very much so, yeah. So tr traceability, or I guess I guess another word, term for that is provenance. But yeah, you have to establish provenance, like, like you said, justify everything, right? So, um, and it's all about something leads back to something which leads back to some standard or some code of regulations or, or, or something like that. Yeah. Um, right. Auditing very much follows that too. You know, you just need to kind of trace everything back um, to the, to the law. So, so there's this world kind of before, let's just zoom, zero in on the data versioning piece for a second. There's this world before data versioning and after data versioning. And it impacts everything from how your ability to debug the application, your ability to distribute meaningful, not just copies, but references to the SMEs. If you took data versioning out of this picture, how long, how much longer do you think your iteration cycles get? Too long. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah um, a lot longer for sure. A lot longer. It's uh it, it, it definitely seems to be one of those key hashes. Like if you have the three hashes, you know, you've got your code, you've got your environment and you got your data. And if you have hashes for all three of those, um, that's a pretty robust model, you know, for thinking about yeah. provenance and traceability and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and without another, that, third piece, you know, everything just kind of falls apart. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I guess another, even if the time is still the same, like if we do the manual process of pointing to some, some data set that may lose, we may lose track of the version, even the time is still the same, ha keeping track of that version itself is important. Um, uh, so just the fact that we know exactly what someone looked at um, and, and when, is uh, a big gain for us in our traceability. Um, but then on top of that, using these, uh, using these tools, um, basically a web interface to data that we store um, in AWS and S3, uh, we also cut out the step of having to have people download data to their machine, look at it, and then either re-upload something or um, uh, even just downloading it and the inefficient process of uh, going through the, uh, the cycles of getting things locally and then sharing it again back in the cloud. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting. I think one, one of the things you just brought up was that S3 can kind of become a black hole, especially for, for non-technical SMEs and subject matter experts is what I mean by that. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk about that. Like, what does it mean? We, we all use AWS console. 
uh, I think everybody on this call also uses Quilt. Is there any, what is the value of being able to just look in S3 and, and not see a bunch of text, but actually see the, the stuff that's there? Yeah, it's definitely, even as a, I guess, regular user of AWS um, or looking at the console, it's kind of not the best looking interface and it's a lot of clicking and pointing. And then, um, you know, then a lot of times you might even have to download the file anyways to view an image or whatever. So yeah, just if you go with Quilt, you can just see uh, if I just click through some random results, uh, first even just the file browser is a, a bit nicer, but then um, uh, then I can directly go through some data, just click on some ran random um, information and see the image directly there um, instead of having to download it, um, uh, view it locally. Um, and also can have, um, these interactive, uh, oops, let me see. Also have these interactive graphs, like like in um, the other demo I showed, but uh, you can still get a version of this to inspect uh, potential outliers um, directly in S3 instead of having to, you know, download everything locally, spin up a Jupyter Jupyter notebook to do all these analysis, um, and then yeah, for some and for some people that's. Uh, many steps too far, um, yeah. unless you're a developer. That, that really <laughs> feels like a cycle time issue for me. And I think one of the, the big things I see with subject matter experts too, especially as the data get large. So I'm thinking like next generation sequencing, it's really disappointing to download a whole file and then be like, oh, that's actually <laughs> not what I needed. <laughs> and if you do image processing of any kind, this is one case where the eyes are just a really good spot check. Like you'll know right away, like, oh, this image isn't or all black or it is all black. So clearly something went wrong. Paul, Paul, I think you were gonna jump in there. Um, yeah, I was just, just wanted to, to build off that. One thing we're excited to, to try with Quilt is, um, so we, we, we process all this data and we, we generate a lot of results and our results are, are, are highly structured. So we have, for every measurement, we tie that to a formal ontology so that hopefully in the future you know ai can reason about all these outputs and make inferences about the world but so so we have a lot of structure to our output and we would love to kind of plug that into quilt search um you know so it'd be very exciting if we could someday we have like ten thousand brains and i could search for say show me all alzheimer's diagnosed subjects less than 50 who are female with this you know and then kind of pull up a subset of data that way that and then and then kind of run that through these sort of visualizations lee's been showing here then then things get really exciting yeah you you mentioned another thing and that's this kind of controlled vocabularies for tagging and so like this process of labeling data sets and i don't even mean labeling uh in terms of you know indicating what what neuropathy or, or what pathology a given brain might have but it's just like hey where did this data come from like what are all the annotations we need and I think one of the links I'll, I'll share with the audience is quilt workflows. And the key idea there is you don't just want people to dump stuff in S3. You want to guarantee something about the quality. And I'm wondering if you talk, I think a lot of our, our, our users are really interested in what, what constitutes an experiment in general. Like what are the dimensions of an experiment? So I guess at the quilt package level or at the data set level, what are the high level things that you want to know besides the date? What are, what are some of the things that you, you track? Um, yeah, so when we run the results, um, yeah, we wanna make sure that our segmentation is actually looking good on the input. So a lot of what we, in our runs, I guess, we would wanna do some quality control um, mm -hmm. of the results before we uh, approve it. Um, so some of it kind of is done internally, like, you know, we, we have a metric and if it's above or below this, we'll reject it offhand and just say, um, and have a list of subjects that were rejected. And then, but then a lot of times um, because of these, uh, these segmentations are like a hard problem uh, to quality control, like algorithmically, you need someone to go in and look at it um, and give a final approval. So that's something that these, uh, interactive um, dashboards would help with. So some, uh, first you can go through every subject manually and go through the, the, the whole brain if you want to. Um, 
And then you can also just look at some of the worst ones. Like if you wanted to uh, look at these, um, which may be lower than the, the rest of the population, um, it kind of helps you uh, pinpoint some of the worst um, or the most, uh, the ones that stand out the most uh, to begin your inspections. Um, yeah, so a lot of the kind of the staging would be from unquality control to uh, this, these data sets were, th or this data set was quality controlled and um, the results seem fairly reliable um, based on uh, uh, visually inspecting the images. And how much of these QC checks that you're talking about are tied into your CICD or, or are these things that you kind of run out of band right now? Uh, yeah, so the, it doesn't really happen in the CICD are, we kind of just do a, for those processes, we're, we're kind of like running an inter, uh, I guess, system level test to make sure we can run a known subject through the whole processing, nothing errors out. Uh, we look at the, um, the uh, report that we get, um, which is, um, and kind of manually check to make sure the, the values haven't changed from last time, uh, unless we expect them to. Um, but, and then for the second, for our validation data set, we, uh, we, we kind of treat it as ground truth more so, uh, where these are more of a curated data set where we kind of, someone has manually gone through a lot of different things. We know that they're good, uh, or some of them are expected, expected to be bad. Um, so we expect failures. Um, and then we run some, uh, quantitative tests like. Um, a dice score to make sure that uh, our segmentation algorithm gives a uh, good result compared to someone who manually labeled it, that sort of thing. Um, but and does that yeah, also run of, in batch or is that a, a these one-off jobs that you run maybe in EC2 or on local machines? Um, we run those using, uh, I think we, we do the processing in batch and then I think the, um, I'm trying to think. I think you run. A I'm trying to remember that, now too. I think yeah. Yeah, all, yeah we you uh, you run a script that uh, launches all the jobs in batch, and then um, or we have a command line tool that launches all the jobs in batch. Uh, once they complete, then um, uh, kind of uh, we usually run it on an EC2 instance that kind of pulls down pulls down all the information and then does the comparisons like on that EC2. I see. Uh, it's just kind of the, the process we settled on during development, which could probably be sped up or improved. So, so the virtuous cycle that we're kind of in now, and I think Paul, you started to talk about, hey, there's a lot more we can do, but is this batch pipeline is generating some data to, in S3. S3 is then snapshotted into a package, and then you can kind of send these immutable URLs out to the SMEs. And now you have this kind of tighter loop where, where everything is reproducible. You already talked about code and containers. What else, uh, as we as you wrap up, uh, and what else should we cover? Any, any questions, Kevin, do you have any questions? Um, what else would, would you two kind of like to talk about? Maybe that would be helpful to other people working in neuroimaging or working with large data sets, uh, thinking about traceability, thinking about compliance. What would, what would be your, your recommendations for them? Uh, let's see. Um... I get. I, I guess I'm a big fan of the everything is code paradigm. Um, so if you if you start and just decide that everything's gonna like the source of truth for everything's gonna be like a Git repo or or or, or Quilt data, but uh, you know if you do that for your website and you do that for your AWS infrastructure and I, I, that might that might be a, a steeper learning curve, but I think it will save you a lot of time in the long run. Um, other things, let me let me think. Um, Lee, jump in while I'm thinking there. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess one thing is where uh, a lot of academics aren't uh, used to using, um, I guess, cloud compute systems, um, which mm -hmm. uh, they're more used to kind of high performance compute um, uh, that academic institutions usually have. Right. Um, so one thing we are trying to do is make it slight, at least slightly easier for um, uh, uh, with open source tools for people not as familiar with um, like AWS, for example, to uh, take advantage of uh, what that provides. Um, so we released an open source tool that um, uh, makes it easier to run jobs on AWS Batch, um, 
which we call batch tools. Right now it's more, it's mostly specific for running our specific job on, um, on batch, um, but we're hoping to kind of make it a little more generic where you can just say, run this command on batch and not have to go through the learning curve of figuring out how to set up an environment. Like there's a lot of steps that are a little tedious that um, uh, from the yeah. outside you wouldn't really expect. Um, uh, so we want to make those things easier. And then also um, uh, make it easy with these interactive visualizations. So your data is stored on the cloud, but you don't have to keep moving it back and forth to inspect the results. You can just do it directly from there. Um, I think the last easy. thing you said is the big revelation for cloud. So in other words, the first thing when you tell people, industries that are used to, let's call them HPC clusters, right? Kind of on-prem infrastructure. They were like, well, you know, I've got X, Y, Z terabytes of data. And if I move it to the cloud, now I have two problems. Like, well, I still have X, Y, Z terabytes of data. But I think the mind blowing thing is, is what you do in data center stays in the data center. And so you don't, the point is not to move my terabytes to the cloud so I can then copy them back to my HPC cluster. It's it, the whole point is that you run your compute next to your data. And I think yeah. data, especially in, in brain imaging is getting so big that it is not feasible. Like you, you wouldn't want to keep hold on to this any any of this on prem because you're you're constantly scaling your isolons or whatever, scaling your network attached storage, right? In in uh, in some pretty let's say mind bending ways. And so yeah, I think that maybe that that uh, leap of oh, that's the whole point of the cloud is it can just stay there, and and we yeah. can do all our compute there, and we only move out the the pieces that we we really need. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. browser-based viewers, I think, would go a long way to help academics with that problem. I, I think a big bottleneck now is there's still like a lot of people still have a workflow with uh, with a traditional desktop viewer. Yeah. So you, you know, and, and then trying to port that to the cloud is is the big stumbling block right now. I think um, there's AWS workspaces too, which let you run Windows. I don't know if they have Mac, but you can run Windows in the cloud. And that oh. gives you some of the, yeah, it's a VM, it's a remote VM. And so, you know, you're clicking on your VM, but that, that might be something that, that people can look at. And I think they've gotten a lot better in the last 12 months. Like I'm hearing good things from the customers mm -hmm. that, that that's now usable. That's very interesting. Uh, one, one app that's used a lot is OpenGL based. So mm -hmm. do, do you know if it does OpenGL or anything like that? I like that. would guess that it does. I mean, I guess it okay. depends on how they do their hardware virtualization. It's worth a try. I'd be kind of surprised if it didn't, just because I would think at least some gamers would try and oh, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. use workspaces. Uh, Kevin, do you have anything anything while we while we wrap up? I think you've covered covered pretty much everything. I know we're short on time. I, I did have one question for Lee and Paul in that you mentioned um, the, you know, the power of web browsers and uh, for both academics, but also for your own work. One thing that is a question on my mind is, are there things that you're now putting with your data, you know, documentation, but also perhaps examples, is there more that rides with the data set knowing that the data set can be previewed? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Like, um... Uh, we can directly store our Jupyter notebooks that we use to analyze the data. We can um, make our readme nicer with images and links to the data instead of uh, yeah, instead of having you know a text file with your data on your computer, um, having a markdown file that directly links to examples or folders um, that's viewed in a browser is much nicer for you know documenting and explaining what you did, um, and then. We haven't done it yet, but it is uh, it is easy to have these uh, these interactive uh, demo visualizations uh, directly on your basically in your README almost um, or right below your README. So you can explain what's what the data set is, how it was analyzed, and get a quick uh, overview of what it looks like all on um, one page. Uh, uh, now that you know that um, someone's going to access it with a web browser. Um, instead of, you know, if you put it all in a, a folder somewhere, maybe someone's not going to get that unless they open up a bunch of files. I yeah, think we, what you just said is data without documentation is meaningless. Uh, at least mm -hmm. 
we like basically you can have a data set and you know okay i have 30 csvs what is this who who touched this what does a normal person do with all of this i think is a huge question in everyone's mind and uh paul I'll let you jump in in just a second world famous research institution in boston and you can guess who who they are uh, we were told that, that they had a policy that any unlabeled data gets deleted after 30 days <laughs> <laughs> like literally to show the fact, right? Like they would rather lose the data than, than have a bunch of data, which nobody knows what it is. And so I think this idea of documenting data is more powerful than, than the world realizes. And I think Kevin and I always said, you know, what is GitHub without readme's? Like, it's a really depressing, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a really, really sad ghost town. Uh, so, so Paul, jump in. I, I think you're going to say something. Oh, I was just I was just going to point out to, to, to Kevin's question. Um, Lee earlier showed uh, some 3D renderings of uh, of brains with overlays, and that's using a package called BrainSprite, um, which, which makes it so smooth. And that's you know that's something that that we can do now, right? We can kind of pre-render that BrainSprite so that it it, it 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 views very quickly in a browser, almost like you wouldn't even know it's interactive. It's so it's so quick. Can, can you go back to that that volumetric rendering Lee, that you have and the and think one of the yeah, brush to use? Let me see. Oh, it looks like something. Oh, I might thinking. have to reload, but uh, no worries. So, so this is probably hardware accelerated. So, so when you're doing the the voxel view uh, of the brain, do you, do you know is this uh, is this WebGL under the hood? I, I don't. Um, so I don't think this is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this um, we render. We create the. HTML file offline and then point our, um, uh, we basically point to it uh, when you click on that image. So I think it's doing something like um, creating sprites of the uh, of the brain, like uh, I guess like oh. 2D animation sprites um, mm -hmm. and then using some JavaScript library to uh, make it look, so it's, it's not actually 3D, it's 2D, but uh, makes it appear like it's 3D, I guess. So yeah, so kinda... all the slices are pre-rendered is what you're telling me? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I see, I see. So so what? this is probably very, well, very for a browser, memory intensive. So I, I think what you're saying is that as you scrub the axes that you, it's swapping in a different 2D image set. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so, so that takes about a minute to pre-render, but we just tack that on to the end of our pipeline and then we can visualize it all. Neat. And, and is the coloration, I guess that's, is that biologically meaningful? Is that some kind of segmentation? Where do you get the, the Yeah, coloration? the coloration is a, the segmentation that we output. Um, and I guess Free Surfer has just labeled, just decided on these color sets for different uh, uh, regions of the brain. Um, okay. We work with Alan Cell as well, and there's there's always a controversy when you put colors on biological entities. Uh, so first of all, they look, they look beautiful, and, and it's very attractive to the eye, but then scientists will <laughs> inevitably <laughs> throw their arms up and say, well, that's not what it really looks like. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting. Well, well great. Um, what, what would you like to say in conclusion? I, first of all, I found that super interesting. I, I, hopefully, I think people will get this general pattern that, that you're really talking about, which is, hey, we've got batch pipelines. We landed in S3. We can capture those outputs in a quote package. We can share those with SMEs. Uh, and anything else that, that you'd uh, like the, the audience to know? Um, no, that's pretty pretty good summary, and yeah, we're hoping to uh, continue to improve these kind of interactive visualization of your results so that it's uh, easier to get insights and um, uh, uh, have nice um, summaries directly uh, directly in your browser, so you don't have to do that whole back and forth uh, between the cloud and your computer and uh, lose track of things. That's kind of the irony of cloud is we have to do a lot of work so that we do less work. But, and I think we're, we're in the, you know, the ends of the do a lot of work phase. Um, automating tasks across subject matter experts and people is hard, but, but like once you get that stone rolling, then it feels like it kind of, it rolls itself. Yeah. Well, great. Well, I want to thank, thank you both for your time. Uh, it was super interesting. We'll, we're gonna get this live. And I think people in neuroimaging and beyond will, will be interested to, to hear your thoughts and, and see what you've done at the pipeline level and, and how, you, how your workflow comes together. Awesome, thank you very much. That was great. Yeah, thanks for chatting with us. Thank you both.